right. Well, thanks for inviting me down. It's, uh, it's nice to be back. I have a, a couple things I just wanted to touch on before the lights get dim. How many people are members of the American Orchid Society? Okay, a, a fair number. Uh, for the last couple of months, uh, a guy named Leon Glissenstein, who used to be with Hoosier Orchids, uh, has been writing articles on Habanaria, and he has pictures on the front cover. This is one of his pictures. And this, the centerpiece of this, uh, there's a plant on the, two plants on the show table. Uh, so take a look at those. Um, he also does speaking engagements, and I've seen his talk on this. It's a little technical, but it, it, it is a wonderful presentation. He has some remarkable photography. So if you're ever looking for another speaker, consider Leon. Uh, this is, is not an encyclia, an epidendrum, which we're talking about tonight, but about 60 miles from my home is one of the largest populations of Cypripedium candidum. And I host a field trip each year to go out and see those, and it's right around Mother's Day weekend. Uh, and I've, I've always been looking for one of these things with two flowers on a flower stem, and somebody in our group found two of them this year. Uh, but more importantly, we found uh, the one on the left there, which is an albino form. This one. Uh, so the normal one, you can see the, the red marks inside the pouch and the, the red marks on the, the sepals. The, the albino is just pure white and yellow, well, yellow and green. So anyway, that was kind of a, an interesting find. If anybody wanted to come up there uh, and, and see those, um, you just had to give me a call at the beginning of May. So there's, there's a close-up of the albino one. Now we're just about to start the presentation, and I want you to read this here. There will be a quiz. Okay, so you, no sleeping in the back. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about epidendrum and encyclia. Um, how many people have ever grown epidendrums and encyclias? Uh, we're we're, we're going to work on that and see if we can get some more interest. It's a pretty big group, and they're related to catlia. So a lot of these will actually hybridize with cattleya. So you'll, you'll get a, an epicat, which is an epidendrum crossed with a cattleya. So you may be growing them and just not even know it. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a pretty big group, and we're going to start with the epidendrums. And what I want to point out here is what makes an epidendrum flower an epidendrum flower, so that when you guys have your show, you can walk around and say, oh, that's not an encyclia, that's an epidendrum. And, and impress all your friends and neighbors. This is the column of the flower. So here's a sepal, a sepal, a sepal, petal, petal. This is a petal that's modified into the lip. And this is the, the sexual part of the flower here, the column. And on epidendrums, the lip is actually fused right to the column. And it ends up making a little tube here, which is a nectary. So the, the pollinating insect sticks its tongue down that tube, okay? So in the epidendrums, the lip is fused to the column, all right? The other things to note are that they bloom from the top of the, the, the cane or the growth, and they don't always have all their flowers open all at the same time. A lot of epidendrums are sort of sequential bloomers. Um, and, and the slides, as we move along, you'll start to see that. This is one that's very commonly grown, and you'll see it at almost every show you go to. Um, it, it's great for the hobbyist because it blooms in February and March. Uh, you might even get some flowers in January down this, this far south. Um, and that's sort of right when you want the color the most. Like, you know, a lot of orchids that bloom in the summer, you think, well, geez, I've got a whole garden full of flowers. What do I need an orchid for? Uh, but this guy blooms right in the middle of the, the late winter, early spring. <clears throat> it's Epidendrum centripetalum. It's also called, called Orstadella centridenia. And the name switches back and forth. The first one I ever bought was an Epidendrum. The second one I bought was an Orstadella. And uh, then now it's an Epidendrum again. <clears throat> so just like everything else, they're constantly fooling you with the names. But one of the things that I want you to note here is this, this is one of what we call the reed stem epidendrums because it's a very thin stem, leaves that alternate up the stem, and then the blooms come from the tip of the stem, just like a cattleya blooms from the, the apex of the leaf. 
the epidendrums all bloom from the tip of the newest growth. Okay. The other thing, <clears throat> you'll see that it has pretty big roots that are just like a cattleya, and like a cattleya, they want to have lots of air on. So most of the epidendrums you want to have them in in potting mixes with good air air movement in them, not in something that's real tight. <clears throat> The other thing with most of the reed stem epidendrums is they throw out cakey growths. Have I told you all why it's called cakey and not cakey? No. Oh, well, we, it, up in Cleveland, I, I'm, in, I'm in five different orchid societies, but up in Cleveland, one of them, we have a, a displaced Hawaiian as a member. And I, I always call them kikis. And every time I would say kiki, he'd say, Edgar, it's cakey. I'm Hawaiian, I know. <laughs> so it's cakey. <clears throat> but these, these will often produce cakeys from the reed stem itself. And that's sort of how these things propagate. If they don't get their flowers pollinated and make seed, they say, well, I'm going to reproduce vegetatively as well. And they form a big colony. This particular one, Epidendrum cendrodinia, is a great plant to grow as a mount. And if, if you can get a piece of tree fern fiber, uh, mounted on that because you get the white roots on the black background of the tree fern fiber, the green leaves and the pink flowers, and it just makes a complete picture. And you, you tie it on very low on the totem of the tree fern, and then as these keikis start to produce, you just take a little pin and pin those back, and they will root down onto that, that mat. Uh, do you all know Russ Vernon? Yes. Um, uh, he has a really big, well, I don't know if he still has it, but he had a really big one of these that he got awarded, I think two years ago up in Lansing. And it was it was pushing bushel basket size. Wow. Uh, so it, it, it can be a really great plant. How many have tried Epidendrum Stanford Yamen? Okay, it, this is a, a really great plant. It grows just like a Cattleya. Uh, it doesn't need quite as much light as a cattleya, but it's got these great flowers, and the flower stems are branching. So a big plant, you'll get branching flower stems, and that carries through to some of the offspring that this is hybridized with. It's a good plant. It comes in, in different varieties. There's an alba variety, which actually has a, a bigger flower than the normal variety, which is kind of unusual. Usually the alba varieties tend to have a smaller flower, but this, this is a great one. It's, a, it's a, a bigger flower, a stiffer, heavier, waxier flower. Uh, and then there's the pink form, uh, which tends to be a very small plant, a diminutive plant. The pink plant, the, from the base of the, the cane to the tip of the cane, is only about 10 inches. The first picture that you saw, those can be about maybe 12 to 15 inches tall. And this white form can be almost 18 inches tall. So there, there's quite a difference in size depending on the, on the color type you get. So th this is the one that you normally see as Epidendrum Stanfordianum. And I, I, if, if you'll note the little spotting on the petals and sepals, uh, that often carries through to the progeny. So we, we might see a, a, a hybrid of this later on. <coughs> There's a, a whole group of epidendrums that stay very small. And if you grow up terrarium type plants or have a poison dart frog, these kind of things do great in a terrarium. On um, one of the walls, put them on a piece of cork or a piece of tree fern fiber or, or even just a stick and they go crazy. Because they bloom from the tip of the new growth, that means that that growth doesn't continue to grow. Then it puts out little side shoots. So it forms this big mat, almost like an indoor-outdoor carpet. It's a really interesting texture plant in a, in a terrarium. Uh, this one on the left is Epidendrum gnomus. And it, that flower is about an inch and a half high. And it's a, it's a really interesting flower. Uh, I know a couple of you came up to the Cincinnati uh, seminar thing. Was it last month? Last month. Yeah. Well, I, I took a big plant of this down there and, and got it awarded. It, it's pending identification, but not that what will go right, but not all mine are properly identified. And this doesn't look quite like the epidendronomus that you see in the literature. The other one here is, is Porpax. And Porpax is kind of interesting because the, the individual flowers look almost like a little beetle. Um, the, the lip is actually divided almost like the wing cases 
of a beetle. Uh, I suspect it is actually an insect mimic. Uh, and then this is an albiform of, of the porpax. And up on the left, is that, what does it say up there? I can't see yeah, it. From Matthews. Matthewsii. Yeah. There, there's a, a bunch of them that look just like that. Matthewsii, long ripens, um, and a couple others. And I have not been able to figure out what the distinctive characteristics are. Uh, there are some that produce two flowers at the end of the growth, some that only produce one. I suspect that's one of the characteristics. But again, it forms this neat mat that, that looks a whole lot like indoor outdoor carpet. Isn't that, that wild? It would be great wallpaper, wouldn't it? Screen <laughs> This This is a plant that I, I first saw down in Ecuador back in 2007. Uh, not this particular one. The one I saw was growing on a rock. Uh, and it, I just love the red flower to it, that, that rich color. And I, I tried to grow it several times, but unfortunately it, it comes from a higher elevation than, than my 1,100 feet. <laughs> and so it, where we found that it was about 6,000 foot elevation and essentially 100% humidity all the time. So I, I couldn't match those characteristics, but I, I would like to see this hybridized with something else to try to get that red color into some other things. It, it forms a really nice plant. Equigenera has these for sale, and sometimes if you bump into them at a show, they'll have one. <clears throat> this is Epidendrum nocturne, and it's a, an extremely variable species. The, the lip, which is the really white part here, uh, can be a little bit different, and I suspect that there's actually depending on what taxonomist you talk to, there might be dozens of different species involved here, but they're all called Epidendrum nocturne. When, again, when I was in Costa Rica, we climbed up on this little hillside, and there was a plant of Epidendrum nocturne that, it was probably 10 foot tall, and it had this flower on it, and right here on the lip, this, this dagger-shaped part that protrudes down the farthest, had an S-curve in it. Oh my. And then, Maybe 10 feet away from that, there was a plant that was only maybe a foot and a half high and in full bloom, and it had a crescent-shaped piece here. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, the, the plant morphology was so different that you wouldn't think that they're really both nocturne, but our guide said they were. And then we went over to the uh, Amazon Basin side, and there was a completely different looking sort of plant. And I said, what's that one? He says, oh, that's Epidendrum nocturne. Uh, so I, I think the taxonomists have some work ahead of them on, on Epidendrum Nocturne, but you can buy these, and the ones that are for sale are the short ones. So you don't need to worry about a 10-foot tall plant on your window sill. Uh, but it, it's a neat flower. They tend to be fragrant. It's a single flower, uh, but it, it's, it's definitely got all the bells and whistles. <clears throat> Into the reed stem Epidendrums, uh, the, the first one that I ever came across was Epidendrum radicans, and shortly after my wife and I got married, we went down to Costa Rica, and while we're driving up the side of a mountain to go up to Monte Verde, there's a, a little Ford tractor on the side of the road, and he's mowing the, the ditch to, to keep the weeds and stuff out, and he's mowing down about an acre of this, and I'm thinking, no, uh, but you know, down there it's just a weed. And the, so it would be like a dandelion to us. But Epidendrum radicans, and, and a lot of this group is actually a, a, a lantana mimic. Yeah. So yeah. these are the Epidendrum, and that's lantana. Yeah. And lantana is pollinated by butterflies, and it's an accidental, we're going to try to lure somebody in here accidentally and see if it gets pollinated. Uh, so it, it's just sort of an interesting evolution in the orchid world. This was the first hybrid made, and I think it was in 1888 by Vetch. And he, he crossed these two and ended up with this, and it's O'Brieniana. And this breeding was done in, in Hawaii, and this is now an invasive plant in Hawaii <laughs> and in Australia as well. Uh, so, you know, if you live in a tropical area, these things, because it's a reed stem epidendrum, and even if they don't get pollinated, they're going to throw out keiki plants from that reed stem. 
And then as it gets top heavy, what does it do? It lays over. And then those roots get down into the ground and it forms a whole new plant. And these things are, are huge, just mats, like, like a briar patch would be for us up here. Uh, that's what the lantana, or that's what this radicans cross does. So after the initial crosses, the, the Japanese growers started fooling around with them, and they started crossing them with a secundum. And secundum comes in a variety of colors. It's not just this pink one you see up here, but it, there's a white form, there's a yellow form, there's a rose-colored form. Uh, so it's a great parent to use because you can use different colors. But the important thing is that the plant is smaller and much more compact, so it's more uh, user friendly to the to the hobbyist. It's not going to be a six foot tall plant. But one of the interesting things with with all of these reed stem types, if, if you look here, the flowers form like a snowball. But if you look at the top, you see more flower buds. So this inflorescence actually keeps growing and lengthening out. The bottom flowers drop off and fresh flowers open. So it always maintains this sort of snowball that just keeps going up and up. I had a radicans that got loose in my greenhouse. And when, when the flower stem got to be seven feet long, I cut it off. Okay, it was just like, OK, you've done your thing. Uh, well, he threw out a cakey up onto the rafter. And I, I've long since, since thrown the plant away, but I still have a cakey thrown up on the rafter. Although I don't water it, it still blooms every year. Uh, so they're, they're, they're tough plants. So the next step in the hybridization of these was to cross it with uh, cinnabarinum. And this is a much bigger flower. Um, it's got that bright orange, but again, see the cluster of flower buds here? And the, the oldest flower is getting ready to drop off. So this, this cluster just keeps moving up. And as long as you are taking good care of your plant and it's got lots of energy, this snowball of flowers just keeps blooming and blooming and blooming. They tend to bloom mostly in the spring and summer, even into the fall. Uh, they, they can bloom any time of year. Uh, but it's primarily a, a spring, summer, fall bloom. So the, the main hybridizer of these now is Cal Orchids. And he's got a whole palette of colors on these. And he's, he's crossed them with the Cinnabarinum to get a more upright plant and to get bigger flowers. And he's got ones that, if you see him at a show, I know Ruth saw him down in, in Florida this last May, and uh, I, I think he said he, he brought like 150 of these plants, and, and the first day he sold out. Uh, but the, it, the flowers on his are easy, an inch and a half to two inches across, really bright, vivid colors on plants that are generally 18, 20 inches tall. So it, it's a really nice plant, and he's, he's doing a great job with them. Epidendrum Parkinsonianum and falcatum. They are very similar. There are some subtle differences when you, the differences are, are really more obvious in the flower than in the plant themselves. But one of the things I want you to see on the plant is that, see how these are very thin, sort of almost terrene leaves that, that hang down. They, they don't go up. And that's an indication, anytime you see a plant like that, it's an indication that it lives in an area where it gets just tremendous amounts of rainfall. And the leaves are designed to shed water away from the plant so that it doesn't rot. So if you're growing one of these, grow it mounted so that the leaves can hang down and in, in warm weather, and you basically cannot overwater it. So just if you're an overwaterer, this is a great plant for you. <laughs> uh, and they tend to be very fragrant. Uh, when you guys hosted the Mid America back in, I don't know what it was, maybe 2007 or 2008 or somewhere back there. Uh, I brought one of these in and had it in the exhibit. And I'm pretty sure it took a trophy ribbon for best epidemic to show. Uh, but it, it's a really interesting plant. This is epidendrum. Can, can you see that stuff on the side? Well, you probably can't read it from where you are sitting anyway. Uh, this, this is epidendrum medusa. And it's medusa because it has all these little hair-like things around the lip. It's got really intense red coloring. This, this grows down in, in Ecuador and, and Peru, maybe probably up into Colombia. It's a high altitude plant, so again, very cool growing. I 
got a couple of these from a, a guy, uh, Orchidius Katia. Uh, he comes to Chicago land. Uh, and I, I want to say he's from Colombia, but I'm not sure on that. He might be from Peru. Uh, but anyway, he, he brought me a couple of these, and I was planning on hybridizing with them. And uh, that's, that's not it. Maybe I went too far. But anyways, I was planning on hybridizing with them. But three weeks after I got them, I had my open house. And like an idiot, I sold them all. <laughs> so I got to wait another year. Uh, this is Epidendrum Parkinsonianum. Uh, this is a, another really new one. I, I'm, I find orange very attractive. And whenever I see an orange flower, I have to buy it. I, I don't even care what it is. It, it's just, it has to come home with me. And this is a really neat one because it's a very waxy flower. And these, the individual flowers can last maybe three months. Uh, but overall, from start to finish, this, this plant can be, be in bloom for nearly a full year at a time. Uh, and you don't cut the inflorescence off because this is one that is liable to throw out a side branch and keep blooming next, next bloom season. So I, I, this is one of my favorites. It's also one of the ones I, I kill most often just because I don't take care of it. I don't repot it when it needs to be repotted in the product. Oh, so. Epidendrum, sued epidendrum. It, uh, they, they love to put funky names like that. This is a clonal name, uh, Rudolph, but it's got a, a pink column with a white anther cap, the orange lip, and the green petals and sepals. And notice that the, the petals and sepals really reflects back, so it, it, they go back behind the flower. It just, it just makes it very interesting. So if you cross these two, this Catlia, and the pseudepidendrum, you get this over here, which is Renee Marquis. Yeah. And you can see how it's flattened out the petals and sepals. They're much more in the same plane now. And it's turned the orange to yellow and the red to pink. Uh, so it, it's kind of an interesting thing. And you can see how dominant this flower shape is when you've crossed it with something like that. Uh, and the, the plant itself has the same basic look as the pseudepidendrum, which is, is essentially a reed stem epidendrum. Uh, but the, these you can often find on show tables in the, at, at various orchid shows. All right, this is a cross. Uh, remember the, the uh, epidendrum stamfordianum? And I said, notice those little red spots on the, on the petals and sepals. Can you see how the, the red spots have come through on the flowers? It's a pure orange cat they have crossed with that epidendrum. And, uh, these, I, I haven't seen them on the show table for a while. Uh, about 12 years ago, everybody had them on the show table. So in another couple of years, it'll probably be the latest new thing again. All, all these orchids tend to be cyclical. So if you wait long enough, they, somebody remakes the cross or reclones them. <clears throat> this is epidendrum magnoliae. It's also often called canopsium and it has a whole list of other synonyms, but it's the northernmost growing epiphyte in North America. I have a, a piece of this, not this plant, but this species that was off of a tree in North Carolina. Uh, so to have a, a tropical epiphyte growing on a tree as far north as North Carolina is, is this is really cold tolerant, and they've, they've been starting to use this in hybridization, one of the things, I, whenever you see a picture like this of a plant growing in the wild, take a good look at everything else around it. Uh, these ferns here are, uh, it's a resurrection fern, polypody is the, the common name, but this is growing on the top of a branch of an oak tree. You, you know the live oaks that put these long horizontal branches out? <clears throat> so this is, is a branch on a live oak and this is growing on top of the branch. And in between rainstorms, this gets very dry. And these ferns actually curl back up and just wait there for the next rainstorm. And then they unfurl again. And that, the epidendrum has a very tough, leathery leaf, just like a cattleya. So it's very drought tolerant as well. Uh, anyway, it's, it's a neat little plant. Sometimes you can find those on, on sales tables. But you're starting to see some hybrids. I know Steve Benjamin had some hybrids with this that was called 
I want to say it was called Green Hornet. Yep. It was this cross oh, Red yeah. Skull and a Doser. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a it's a nice little plant. And, uh, I, I think you'll probably end up seeing more hybrids with this now that it's in cultivation. Um, okay, this this is Epidendrum medusa. And then this is Epidendrum porpax, the one that looks like a little beetle that forms that big carpet. This this plant, the the growth on the plant is maybe about four inches long and wants to hang down, whereas these growths want to just climb all over the trunk of a tree and form a big mat. When you cross the two, you get this, which is called Panama ruby. And it, it's a really nice flower, and it's, it's quite variable. I've had ones that had the green spot in it, and I've had ones that were solid red on the lip. Um, so you're starting to see some of those um, in the marketplace. But this is the cross that I wanted to make with my, hopefully, epidendrum nomus crossed with this. And uh, because this already has just a little bit of fimbriation on the lip, I'm just thinking that the two are sort of meant to go together. And it would make that, if, if you can get an offspring, the, the warm loving gnomus would make a broader temperature range tolerance. So you, you might get some really interesting offspring out of that. But I gotta wait another year. Okay, this, this is a commercial interruption. Brought to you by Windswept in Time. <laughs> we, we have two open houses every year, and the next one is going to be November 3rd and 4th. Uh, so mark your calendars, and if you can make your trip all the way up to Cleveland to see the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, you can stop at my place if you need orchid supplies. Wayne Roberts from Roberts Flower Supply is about uh, 20 miles away from me. Uh, but there's lots to do up in Cleveland. Uh, but most importantly, there's orchids. Okay, so now we're into the encyclia. I, I'm going to take a step back. Remember what makes an epidendrum an epidendrum is that the lip is fused to the collar, right? So it forms a little tube that the insect puts its, its proboscis down. Okay, so now we're in encyclia. And encyclias have a different sort of a uh, look to them. They still bloom from the top of the pseudobulb, uh, but the lip is different in that it's not completely fused to the column, it encircles the column, okay? So it doesn't, it, it forms sort of a tube, but it's not a, a straw-shaped tube, it's open on the sides, okay? So the plant itself, you will see pseudobulbs like this. They tend to be sort of uh, egg-shaped but pointy at the top with usually a pair of leaves at the top. Uh, very stiff sort of leathery leaves, kind of like a somewhere between a cymbidium and a cattleya. <clears throat> the, the roots are just like cattleya roots and they really want to be out in the open. So you can see the inflorescence arises right from the uh, the tip of the pseudobulbs, where all the leaves meet the pseudobulb, the inflorescence comes out. Most of these have branching inflorescence. Um, and a, a lot of them have various striping and things in the lip. This, this is the one that you're most likely to see, Epidendrum cordigera. It's, it's got a whole host of synonyms, Atropurpurea, uh, but you're these days, most people are calling it cordidra. <clears throat> and this has just a, a wonderful fragrance. Yeah, you will often smell these at the show before you see them. It comes in a bunch of different color forms. This is the alba, this is the rosia, and this is the semi-alba. And the semi-alba, she's having this little heart, pink heart-shaped mark on the lip. And again, notice the, the flowers the petals and sepals tend to be in the same plane, but then they're what I call sort of crab shape, in that they, they claw over. Uh, so you see them hooked back towards the front. The awarded ones of these that you see are getting better and better, and they're getting them flatter and flatter, and that's what they're breeding for, is, is a flat flower and less of that, that sort of crab shape to it. This, again, picture grown in the wild, this tells you all kinds of information about it. 
It's grown right on the tree trunk. If you look at that tree, there's no leaves on the tree. It's not a dead tree. This tree, although it's in a tropical area, is deciduous because it has a dry period. Okay? So part of the reason you can tell that is if you look at the trunk of the tree, there's no moss, there's no, there's nothing else growing there. It's just bark with this beautiful cordigera. Mm -hmm. um, so th this tells you that they want to be red on in, in sunlight. They, they want bright light. They typically have a dry season, and that typically corresponds to our winter when it's cool. A lot of these come from fairly high elevation uh, in Mexico and Central America, where during what's our winter time, that's their dry season. So if you're growing these, keep them drier in the winter time when it's cool. If you keep them wet in the winter time, you'll rot the roots off of them. Okay, that's the real key to growing these things. And if you can grow them mounted, if you have the space, they, they do absolutely fantastic mounted. If you're growing them in a pot, use something that doesn't decay, like wine corks or those ceramic pellets. Uh, the idea is that you don't want to have to repot it all the time, but if you wait till your potting mix starts to go south, you will have already lost the root system. I had a, a great big cordigera that I grew on a piece of cork, and rather than grow it with the cork vertical like this, I put wires in each of the corners, and I grew it like this, as though my plant were sitting on the top of a tree branch, and that thing just took off. Uh, I had been struggling it with it in a pot, and it took off, and I would say within about four or five years, it was over the edges of a 15 by 12 inch piece of cork, and I was getting eight or 10 flower stems every summer, uh, and then I got tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> he went to the compost pile. <laughs> Again, you, you can see mounted, and you, a, a lot of you may not realize this, but when you water your orchid plants, the, the roots should go from this gray, silvery color to a green color. And that's how you know that the root is fully saturated with water. And the reason it's green when it's fully saturated with water is because you filled all the air spaces in the root with water, and now you can see into the root and see that it's filled with chlorophyll. And those roots are doing photosynthesis just like the leaves. So ideally, this plant really expects to have its root system right out in the open, and it does its, its photosynthesis when the roots are dry. Okay. So if, if you can grow them mounted, that's really the way to do it. Um, I, I'm not going to bore you with a whole bunch of different species names, but you, hopefully you can read what it is. It's my opinion that most of the encyclias look pretty much alike. There's different colorings and stuff. This one is kind of interesting, though, because the, the part that encircles the column uh, is, is almost like little wings. I mean, it, it's, a, it's very sizable on that one. This is one that you'll often see in H&R. Uh, H&R Nurseries in Hawaii sells this. Uh, it, it's Bractescens, and it, it stays very small. Uh, from, from the top of the pot to the top of the plant is probably about 11, 12 inches. And you can just get tons of these fragrant flowers on it. And this is used a lot in hybridization to keep the plants small and lots and lots of flowers and easy to grow. It also stays very compact. It, it doesn't have a big rhizome between the growths or anything, so it stays in a, in a small pot. It doesn't take a very big pot to get a specimen plant. Can you see what I've got here? Oh, this is on Cidioides. Uh, Equigenera often has these on their show table, and it's another one that does really well mounted. I, I have a couple of these growing in the greenhouse because it blooms in the spring for me and it's a great show plant for me. So I have two of them growing and the pseudo bulbs are, uh, they're much bigger than a chicken egg, you know, probably about the size of a goose egg. Wow. Uh, and, it, and that becomes part of the sculpture. Uh, so I, you know, sometimes it's not all just about the flower, but the, the whole plant can make a sculpture. This is one of the smallest of the encyclias. This is uh, Encyclia polybulbon. The, 
the flowers are about an inch tall, and the growth is maybe an inch and a half long. It blooms in the winter time. And this is a, a species that comes from Mexico, again, where it has a dry rest period in the winter time. So again, if you give it a little bit of a dry period during our cold period, it blooms during show season. <clears throat> then it, it's really neat because again, it forms this big mat, almost like an indoor-outdoor carpeting. And they're starting to use this in hybridization. And if you cross these two, the Encyclia cordigera with Encyclia polyglobi, anybody want to guess what you would get? Something that, that the leaves on, on this guy are usually maybe 15, 18, even 20 inches long with a pseudo bulb about the size of a chicken's egg. This guy, uh, the pseudo bulb is about the size of a big pea. And when you cross the two, every now and then it's like magic and things work out. Oh, wow. Wow. Isn't that sweet? You have one? Yeah. Wow, I want one. <laughs> I'm not so mad. I'm trying to cross those two, but they don't, they blow at different times, so I have a hard hard go. But that, that, to me, that's a real keeper. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of related genera in Encyclias and Epidendrums. Uh, this is Eukyle. Uh, you will often find it as as uh, Encyclia. This is Citrina, and it, it has a citrus fragrance to it. It's a cool growing plant, and it's 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 kind of hard to grow. I've been growing it for six years, and it gets a little bit smaller every year. <laughs> I have still that kind of flower, uh, but I, I'm anticipating. And, and this is not upside down. It's a pendulous plant, and so it, it hangs downwards. Uh, there are a couple other eukyles, and then there's a whole bunch of these what we would call a cockle shell. I, I call them squid orchids because to me it looks more like a squid. But, uh, these these are quite fragrant. Yes. It's not necessarily pleasant fragrance. <laughs> to me, it smells more like smelling salts. <laughs> but uh, it, it's an interesting flower, and because of the way they grow, you, you see, it's got flowers open and unopened buds. These usually start blooming in late May into June, and will have flowers all the way through still September, October. Uh, so if if you're looking for a plant to put in your collection to fill in a big gap of, I want to have a flower open year-round, this this is a good one to have in your collection. Uh, it's They've just changed the name again. It, it, it was in, in Cyclia, and then it was Epidendrum, and then it was Prostachia, and now it's something else. Uh, and Kylum, I think. Uh, I, there's a limit to how many times I'm willing to change a label, and they, they have exceeded yeah. that limit. Uh, but here's prismatic carpum and uh, fragrance. fragrance. Uh, and both of these are quite fragrant. Uh, and a, a very similar growth habit to those. These ones like lots of water. So again, if you're in over water, these guys both like pretty much the same conditions as Phalaenopsis, but just a little bit brighter light. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Epidendrum or Encyclia? Encyclia. Encyclia. Why? Because of the... Because of the, the yeah. It's not a tree. It's it, it, it encircles it like yeah. the column. It's hard to tell. Yes. Encyclia. Yeah. Yeah. That's just a different color form yeah. from what I showed you earlier. Yeah. Okay. Epidendrum or Encyclia? Yeah. 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 Epidendrum. You, you can tell partly because it has this more of a weed stem look to the plant. And you can see that the column is fused right to the lip. This, this I bought from Equigenera. And if, it's, it's a little pricey, but the plant only gets to be about a foot tall. For me, it bloomed three times in a year, and it was intensely fragrant. And I, I bought two of them, sold one, and after a year I killed the other one. Okay, that's, yeah, so it is, it is an epidendrum. Encyclia or epidendrum? Yeah. But, but look at the leaves. The leaves should tell you something. They're, they're long, 
cat layer sort of leaves, sort of like a symbidium. Tells you it's an insect layer. And who names these things? <laughs> Said that? Thank well said. Uh, it is an angraecum. It's one of, the, okay. one of the very few angraecums with color. Uh, that's the figuary. And uh, the, the reason you can tell it's an angraecum is in part because it blooms from between leaves. It's got a long nectary tube on the back of it, which you can't really see in that picture. Uh, but also, it's got a really stubby little column. Mm -hmm. Um, so, that's it. I'd like to talk just a second or two about culture. Um, all of these like fairly bright light. Um, you can grow them in less light, but they'll bloom better with brighter light. The reed stem epidendrums, uh, like the, the radicans and, and those, those ones from Cal Orchid, those like actually fairly bright light, but they can tolerate a tremendous amount of shade and still bloom, but they'll bloom better with brighter light. Also, it's been my experience that plants that are grown in very bright light tend to be shorter. And plants that are grown in shade tend to be bigger because they're, they're looking to capture a certain amount of energy. And if they can't get it with short little stubby leaves and bright light, they're going to have great big long leaves in the shade. So they, they tend to be bigger if you're growing them shady, but they will still bloom. Um, most of the epidendrums, evenly moist all spring and summer and fertilize pretty heavily because that's their growing season. In the fall, when, when our growing areas are cooler, you can keep them a little bit drier, but they still need water. Um, almost all of these are gonna be evergreen, so they, they should not be dropping their leaves. If they're dropping their leaves, on you know, year-old growth, there, there's, a, there's an issue. Uh, they should hold their leaves for a couple of years. The, the same with the encyclias. Those should hold their leaves for four or five years. Um, and the encyclia bulb is very much like the pseudo bulb on a cattleya. That if you see that start to wrinkle up, you know there's an issue that either you're losing your roots and it's not able to replenish the water, or you're not watering it enough or it's doing something like blooming and growing at the same time and it's using up all that stored water. So a lot of times just looking at the, the stem of the plants will tell you if, if your watering is okay. If you can, plant them in potting mixes that don't break down quickly because both of these, you're watering really heavily all spring and summer and your potting mix can, can go south pretty fast. So try to pot them up in things that have a, a long shelf life, the, you know, the orchiata, or add wine corks or cork bark to it, or the ceramic pellets. Uh, lots of that sponge rock, it's a man-made pumice. The pumice stone would work great. Anything that just doesn't decay to help hold that open superstructure so they can get lots of air. I would also, if you're going to grow the encyclia in pots, I would consider growing them in clay pots so it dries out a little quicker when you do water. Uh, because they really have that more cattleya root structure, drying out quickly is important. Um, so it wet all the time to rot the roots off. Did you say wine corks? Wine corks, yep. Okay. So this is your incentive to have more wine and cheese. Now I know what to do with yeah. them. <laughs> all right, any questions? Divided. Yes, both can be divided, um, and you use the standard rule of three growths on either side of where you divide the, the rhizome. If you have a, a reed stem epidendrum that's putting out a keiki, wait until the keiki starts putting out a new growth of its own before you break it off. When that when the new growth off of the keiki growth is starting to put out roots of its own, that's the time to break it off the mother plant and pot it up because those new roots will go into your potting mix and it has all the stuff from the old plant to give it the stamina and wherewithal to survive the transition. 